in Genesis, the title King's Battle, in what may be considered the first war after the flood. Abraham's nephew Lot and his family are taken captive with all their possessions from their home in Sodom. Abraham, a man of peace, trains a small force to go and rescue Lot and his family. It's a Hollywood movie over and over again. Taken, Abraham edition, as you can even hear him saying, if you are looking for ransom, I can tell you, I don't have money. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills, skills I have acquired over a very long career. Skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. If you let my nephew go now, that'll be the end of it, right? Abraham returns with Lot and his family, and not just their possessions, but all that was taken. Keeping none for himself, he offers a tithe to the mysterious Melchizedek, the king of peace, the high priest. Who is this king and priest? Is scripture really silent on this? Let's explore and learn how the Bible fully identifies this figure and the mystery will be resolved. The mystery of Melchizedek and his priestly order. Now we dive deeper. Did the last video prove our position? Well, it went pretty far. It set foundation and obliterated Pharisee leaven, but now we firm this up. And even some of the little minor <laughs> objections we received, they're done by the end of this video. Uh, we do that, you know. There is so much to cover as we go to Hebrews especially. And then, did you know the temple priest exiled to Qumran actually preserved this interpretation, which agrees with Hebrews yet dated to at least the first century B.C., mid in fact, before Messiah was even born. This is awesome. We know Melchizedek is not Shem. That's ridiculous. He was dead. I know there is a Z in the word before Shem must uh, match, right? I mean, that, that, that's the way it works, right? <laughs> no, it's not. That's Rabbi Babel. Not logic and absolutely no support otherwise. Yeah, someone brought up the book of Jasher. Jasher is not scripture, has no historicity, was found in the 1500s or so by a Kabbalist who likely wrote it. It is not the Jasher of scripture, which likely refers to, as it is the book of righteousness, something within Torah that's missing like, oh, let's say, Jubilees, far more likely. Just another rabbi babbling away. And someone dumb enough to write it down, and oh, he must be right, right? I mean, isn't that how it works? A fool rambles, and it's written down, and it's, you know, thousands of years old, so it must be true, right? Wrong. Well, it was rebuked by Messiah many times, as the opposite of the word, Rabbi Babel, that is, the Pharisees. In fact, this is the core issue in taking down Phariseeism, Melchizedek which stands against Yahusha, Phariseeism does, and stands against Melchizedek? Hmm, is this king and priest Yahusha? Let's examine. Time to know for certain. This has never been a topic of coherent debate, and you'll see that by the end of this video. The Bible settles it, and those opposed to it, while they oppose the Bible, they don't represent it. Let's go. Beginning in Hebrews 5, and yes, this is a YouTube video, and we will not cover all these chapters in full, but we encourage you, read them all. It's always good to do. Confirm everything. Prove all things for yourself. Verse 5 is where we'll begin. So also Messiah glorified not himself to be made in high priest, so he didn't do that himself. But he that said unto him, who's that? Yahuwah. 
Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. Now we know Yahusha is the only begotten son, meaning birthed in the flesh by a woman, but he existed prior. As he saith also in another place. Ah, what other place? Well, the Old Testament, you'll see. Thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. Is this prior to being in the flesh as well? We'll see. Who in the days of his flesh, meaning there were days prior, see, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Now, we all know the Garden of Gethsemane, but follow the author's progression Another place, or really time, the Old Testament, then made flesh and dwelt among man. Then the night before his sacrifice. Is something forming here? Let's see. It appears so. Follow the progression here. Verse 8. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Now, he progresses to death and resurrection, ascension. And being made perfect, well, that was done in his ascension. He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Now, he's seated on the right hand of the Father, even, right? Called of Elohim and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, when? Did that happen? Is that a new declaration somehow? Well, no. It's not a new order, and that is for sure. The order of Melchizedek we see in the time of Abraham, right? That's who Abraham tithed to. Let's keep reading. Of whom we have many things to say, and he will, he'll say many, and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. Hey, he said that, not me. Okay, <laughs> oops, uh, pray that is never any of us. How about that? But Peter told us why they are dull of hearing, or what he calls willing ignorance in our age. They pursue their own lusts. What is that? What's well, the satanic commandment? Do what thou wilt. And that is embedded in many church doctrines. Yes, it is. Fast forward to chapter 6, verse 20 in Hebrews. And here we have another mention of the priesthood of Melchizedek. And we'll continue. Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Yahusha, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So who is our high priest now? Well, Yahusha is, and forever. We know this. We will look at this word as well, and it defines the criteria for anyone in order for them to be in this order of priesthood, the priest, the high priest. This is well defined, and Shem can't fit, not in many ways, nor can Michael, the archangel. They do not qualify, in fact, and we're going to get there and obliterate both of those by the end of this video. Let's turn to chapter 7, verse 1, and there is a lot here. We're going to hang out here for a bit because this is good. And really, this is going to settle everything. Now, the author of Hebrews, we believe, but we cannot prove, is likely James, or really Jacob, the brother of Messiah. His name wasn't James. <laughs> and there's no J in ancient Hebrew, so it doesn't work. But he defines this with the interpretation of, of the Old Testament account, it's right here. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, peace, priest of the Most High Elohim, yeah, and certainly not in Nephilim strongholds, as some claim it is Jerusalem, Israel, at that point, which is a Nephilim stronghold. And by the way, that includes the priest that's mentioned in Jasher, which, by the way, Adonai Zedek is also mentioned in Torah, and let's be very clear, he is not a priest of Yahuwah. 
That is a false name. Yeah, it sounds similar. It sounds really good. It is not. He was an enemy of Israel who feared Israel, knowing that they killed Nephilim, likely his people. We can't prove he was a Nephilim specifically, but very likely. And this is basically the tactic of the synagogue of Satan and always has been. And it remains today. And of course, they'll defend him, their fellow Nephilim. So, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. We read this, but wait a minute. Do we interpret this as the king of Jerusalem. Well, no, actually we don't. This is the Bible telling us how to interpret the Bible. It's right here. Those are adding to the word in error as usual. Let's read. First, being by interpretation, king of righteousness. Wait a minute. You mean the Bible already interpreted what this means? Yeah. Now, we'll show you the Hebrew word Melki means king, Zedek means righteousness, or priest, righteous priest, same. Is he king of Jerusalem? No. Did James or Jacob really not know where Jerusalem was when he wrote? Uh, Well, of course he did, and here is how he says to interpret this. He's basically saying, not Jerusalem. There you go. And after that, also, king of Salem, which is king of peace. Oh, wait, it's not Jerusalem. It's king of peace. So, king of Salem is not the king of Jerusalem. It means king of Shalom, peace. That's it. Don't you think the brother of Messiah would know better than any modern scholar and the fraudulent book of Jasher that we have today created by a Kabbalist in the 1500s or so? Yeah, no thank you. And the rabbis or Pharisees, well, their opinion is worthless. And Yahusha told us so. So we don't have to go far to find that. Remember, this is not commentary. It's Hebrews, even in the New Testament. Any scholar who disagrees or tries to debate with James, Jacob, is no Bible scholar. They don't believe it. Any New Testament scholar not reading Hebrews, including this extensive understanding of Messiah's priesthood, is not a New Testament believer. They're just not. They're not a New Testament believer. They are a fragment deceiver. Nice rhyme. So, simple question. Who, in all of Scripture, is a king and a priest? Hmm. A righteous one. Who is the king of peace? Ah. Who is, or another way to put it, is the mm, Lord of the Sabbath? Well, that's rest, peace. Ooh, how about that? Who is the king of righteousness? I mean, is this really hard? The Bible, and that is what this is, we didn't write it, and no scholar can overcome it, defines this. But one, one fits this, and only one. This is a priesthood of one. Certainly, Shem is not king of peace and righteousness. That's just stupid from rabbis to claim such. Certainly not Michael either. Oh, he's righteous, but he is not a man, not a king, and not a king of men. Angels do not have such role in Scripture. Now, Hebrews fully narrows this down entirely. The priestly order, one and only one, applies. Now the debate ends. It's over. It's done. There is nothing to discuss after this. Without father. That's not Shem. Without mother. Without descent. Now, we all do know Shem had a father and mother. It's recorded right there in Scripture. We know about Noah and Emzara, right? Can these rabbis even read? Well, clearly not. Clearly, they don't read the New Testament. But if you are Messianic, aren't you supposed to be? 
Yes, Michael can qualify for this part so far, but it won't now. Having neither beginning of days nor end of life. Now, Michael has a beginning of days on the first day of creation when the higher classes of angels were all created. He is not from prior to that. Prior to that, there were only two, the Father and the Son. That's it. Now, even Giza Worms makes that mistake, and this is pretty clear, it is not. But made like unto the Son of Elohim. Oops! Who can that possibly be? Well, it's not Shem. It's not Michael. Not this. This is the New Testament Greek, by the way, not the Hebrew. This is specific to Yahusha and only Yahusha. No one else is in the running here. And there is absolutely and firmly no debate except among those who cannot read, especially as we continue through this whole passage, which says it over and over and over. It's unmistakable and not up for debate. Abideth a priest continually. Do what? Wait, wait a minute. How can this Melchizedek abide as a priest continually? Well, he's there in Genesis. Huh? It's pretty simple. We all know Messiah was since the beginning. He has no beginning of days. He has no end. He is not just the priest of Melchizedek. He is the only priest Melchizedek. He's the only one that qualifies for the order in the first place. There is no one else. No one else fits in the Old nor the New Testament. Period. Only Elohim, the Father and the Son, can claim no descendancy. That's it. And before creation, because that is all that was there. Those two. Now, we covered that well in this series, uh, in 22 Works of Creation, among other videos. Now, he wraps this up in a bow for us, as if he didn't already, really. Now, consider how great this man was unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. Wait, that's a pretty special occurrence, isn't it? Think about Think about it. There's no priesthood yet. There's no Levitical priesthood. Levi isn't born. Read what James is saying here, and he's likely the author. This is no ordinary man. It is Messiah, the only one who can even qualify for this priesthood. This is a priesthood of one. And verily they that are the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law. Now, what did the people give to them? though? Well, they gave them food. That is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. So they were men from Abraham's bloodline. Well, so was Messiah. Well, yes, he was. However, he has another lineage that has no descent. So they are just men. Melchizedek, though, according to this, is more than just a man. And that can only be Messiah. But he whose descent is not counted. Well, there is no other man without descent. Shem is out. Shem is out twice, three times, four times, 12 times, 50 times. You've got to be kidding me. Yet some stick to that. Why? Well, because the Pharisees say so. That's what they're really saying. No, thank you. Yes, he is from the tribe of Yehuda, Judah, on Mary's side. There's no doubting that on his human side. But the other side has no descent. And he has always been with no beginning and end. Anyone even suggesting any man nor angel could remotely fit this must ignore what it says. I mean, it, it just said what it said, right? Thus, it is not a position. They're just agitating. From them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. Yehusha was there in the Old Testament. He showed up, and this is not the only time. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. Now, he entrenches this a thousand percent, 
There is no discussion to be had. And here, men that die receive tithes, mortal priests of man, the Levites. But, look at this, but there, where? In Genesis, with Abraham, there he receiveth them. Who? Of whom it is witness that he liveth. Now this is the New Testament. After Messiah's resurrection and ascension, folks, we know how to read this. Who is he that lives? We all know. And there is only one. Yahusha, Messiah. That's it. And as I may so say, Levi also, who receiveth tithes, again, temporary priesthood, paid tithes in Abraham. Now, understand what that's saying. Where did Levi, or Levi, some would say, come from? Great-grandson of Abraham. He's not even born yet. Thus he, his lineage, paid tithes to an immortal priesthood. That's what Abraham was doing. He wasn't paying tithes to a priesthood not even born yet who is defined as one who has no beginning and no end. The one who lives, we know that is Messiah. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him, talking about Levi. Indeed, this is even before Isaac, nor Jacob, Jacob, who is Israel, the father of Levi. So Levi, not even born. There was already a priesthood, yet it is an immortal priesthood of one. Only one who would become flesh. And he says right here that the same who did and is the one who lives or resurrected from the dead. Just as David prophesied as well of Messiah, as he knew that Melchizedek was the one and only Messiah to come. This writer knew Yahusha, watched him die and resurrect and descend, and then wrote this tie to the Old Testament Melchizedek as the same person. And if that is not enough, well, he'll clarify it yet again. If, therefore, perfection were by the Levitical priesthood. Now, let's be clear. It never was. Only Yahusha lived perfect. Scripture's clear. All else sinned and fell short and still do. Never once does the Bible ever say the law is salvation, number one, nor that the Levitical priesthood nor any patriarch was perfect. Um, they were perfect for a time such as Enoch, such as Noah, but not perfect, not like Messiah, no. For under it, the people received the law, the Levitical priesthood. What further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? See, another priest did not rise. Because Melchizedek, well, that is Messiah. The order of Melchizedek is not a new order. It's the old one. Before the law of Moses, with its own law, of which the law of Moses was based, we have returned to this order. Not being released or relieved of ever keeping righteousness ever again. That's called sin. That is what the law is, and certainly given license to follow the church's edict of the, well, satanic commandment to sin, do what thou wilt. No, that's never in Scripture. Never one time is that in Scripture. Only fragments, especially from Paul, out of context, just as Peter warned he was being taken out of context 2,000 years ago. For the priesthood being changed, now what does he mean? The priesthood changed. Well, it's simple. Yahushua is our priesthood now and forever. No Levites needed. Got it? So it changed. 
There is made of necessity a change also of the law. Oops. Did he just say the law was abandoned? Well, that's not what he just said. It was not abandoned. It was changed. And what is it that changed? What did it change to? Well, what is this chapter and much of the previous about? Well, he actually began with a Sabbath sermon in chapters 3 and 4. Yet we're told that passed away. Yet he says it didn't. And he tells us the Sabbath remains. And tells us if you're not keeping it, you are categorized as an unbeliever. That's what Hebrews says, and it's in the New Testament after Messiah's ascension. Do we read the Bible or not? This is after Messiah's ascension. Yes, we are under a new covenant, as was Moses. Yet, what order are we serving as high priest? Melchizedek. The same order to which Abraham tithed. We have returned to the order of the Creator. The Melchi king and Zedek priest, Melchizedek. The one and only one. Yet Messiah Follow the same laws in the law of Moses, did he? He was the priest of Melchizedek. So is there a conflict there? Let's be clear. That is just the earlier order. It's not a new one. And basically, the law of Moses in basis is the law of the order of Melchizedek, which is where we are now and forever. We've returned to it. We must have law, or we are lawless, and the very definition of such is sin. Yahushua did not come to bring sin, and that's what most of the church is saying. In most denominational churches, that is their foundational doctrine. What a foundation that is, built on sinking sand. It's not Bible. Yes, the priesthood changed back to Messiah. The law did as well, but he's not even done yet. Keep reading. The rabbis have leveled this charge at Yahushua many times. He was not a Levite. Actually, there are names of Levites within his lineage, and some have tried to make that connection, though not definitively uh, as Levites, just the names. But no one ever really needs to prove that. I mean, it's it really, you're playing to Pharisee leaven when you even do it. It's not necessary. The Levite order is done. Useless. No longer needed in this sense. Unless it is under the order of Melchizedek, because that is the order of this era and the rest forever. This is completely damning to Judaism. And that's why this has become such a polarizing issue, which is impertinent even if they somehow were Hebrews, but they are not, but do lie. Revelation 2, 9 and 3, 9. It shows you how far rabbis abide in the opposite direction because they do not serve Yahuwah. Now, let's read. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, See, James is going to deal with this. So he's not a Levite. He's not a Levite priest. He's not from that priesthood. He's from a different priesthood. He's already said that. Of which no man gave attendance at the altar. So he means Judah. And the priesthood are the Levites. And his being from Judah means he wasn't from Levi. Well, that's true. That's fact. But he's going to explain. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, indeed, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. That's true, because Judah is not the priesthood and still is not because it is not his human lineage. However, Judah has the scepter and is the king. So it's that lineage that brings the king, and that's important. So, What defines his priesthood? Well, it's a priesthood of one. It's Melchizedek, not Levi. 
And it is long before Levi was even born, because we see it right there. Abraham tithed to this priesthood before Levi even existed. And it is yet far more evident. For that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest. The priesthood changed. He just told us. Who is made, not after the law of a carnal commandment. In other words, this priest is not a mere man, but after the power of an endless life. Now that's Messiah, period. For he testifieth, now who is he? Messiah testifies with his life. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He is the high priest forever, and this is the order of Melchizedek. The ancient order returned from the Creator. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment. A lot of people misread this, so let's break it down a little. Going before the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. He'll explain this. Keep on. For the law made nothing perfect, and the Old Testament never makes such claim that it did. No, it did not. The Pharisees do, and everyone in the New Testament railing on that is talking about the Pharisee application and claim of the law falsely, never against the law of Moses. Though not perfect, its law came from the finger of Yahuwah in part, and that part would certainly be perfect in that respect. And he well knew the law of Melchizedek, did he not? How can the church assume otherwise? That's the amazing question. But the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto Elohim. And inasmuch as not without an oath, he was made priest. Thus, Yahusha is not even a Levite period. He does not need to be and should not be, actually, and it is better that he is not. He is the priest of all time, always has been. This is why he had to come from Judah, because he needed the kingship, the earthly kingship to go with it. Yes, man, Israel, was given a physical priesthood, an imperfect yet necessary priesthood for a time. That priesthood has been replaced with Yahusha, but he is the ancient priest, not a new one. See, before Israel entered covenant as a nation, Abraham had no need for priests. He spoke to Yahuwah and clearly Yahusha, Melchizedek, directly. For the illiterate rabbis who claim he had to be a Levite, they can't even read Genesis nor Psalm. Messiah was the priest before the Levites, and he came in the flesh, something they can never reproduce with their false messiahs. They just can't. And he restored his ancient order of Melchizedek, king and priest, pulling it all together. He's the king of peace, the king of righteousness. It's simple. Who else has lived a sinless life? No one. Yet Melchizedek has and that must be Messiah, because he's the only that could qualify. Paul knew that, Romans 3.23, and Paul was no longer a Pharisee in doctrine. He knew better. For those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent, that's Yahuwah, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Quoting Psalm. So this is Old Testament knowledge, which we covered in the last video. Melchizedek is Messiah. Even David says so. By so much was Yahusha made a surety of a better testament. Indeed, the very law of creation. And they truly were many priests, because 
they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. In other words, there was a turnover in the priesthood because we are humans and we are mortal and we die. So it was passed from one to the other. But this man, talking about Melchizedek here, because he continueth ever, not only Messiah fits this, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Hebrews tells us later, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever even, 13.8. Yet yesterday for him is before creation. He has never changed and nor has the order, the priesthood of Melchizedek, Yahusha. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto Elohim by him. Oh, that also pretty much tells you this is only Messiah. Because no man comes unto the Father but by me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Right? John 14, 6. He's not a mere priest. He can literally save their souls just as David prophesied as well in Psalm 72. Seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Who does that? Messiah does. Wow. For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. What exactly is there to debate here? Nothing. This is all Messiah. Why is he so much more powerful? This was the plan all along. We were promised many times in the Old Testament as well. Who needeth not daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifice. Now understand, the Pharisees, at the time of this writing, were still offering sacrifices in the temple. They defiled. Even at this point, before the temple was destroyed. It's false and useless at that point, and Hebrews does tell us that too. But here's why. First, for his own sins, and then for the people's. For this he did once, when he offered up himself. No, this is not saying that Messiah sinned. No. His sacrifice is sufficient, replacing animal sacrifice. And that goes for every Sabbath and every feast, which is why we no longer need animal sacrifice, because it could not live up to his sacrifice. But that does not mean the Sabbath nor the feast could possibly pass away, because they indisputably do not in Scripture. Read our book, Rest the Case for Sabbath. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, they're not perfect. They are not Messiah. They, too, have sinned and fallen short, just as you know, Paul told us, Romans 3.23. All patriarchs and priests did. None of them were perfect. But the word of the oath, which was since the law. Ooh, what law? When was his oath? Before creation. Therefore, this law is from before creation. Maketh the Son, that's Yahushua, who is consecrated forevermore. The Son is only Yahushua. No one else can be in this order of Melchizedek. There's no room. There's no need because he is forever. It just can't work. No speculation nor guessing needed. No passage can overrule. This is so super clear. So this oath is from before creation. This law is from before creation. This is Melchizedek, a king and priest, the king of righteousness, Yahusha, the high priest. He's not new. The oath is not new. The law is not new. Just look at the very root words here for Melchizedek, and we'll go to the Dead Sea Scrolls in the end. It's two words. Melchi means king overwhelmingly thousands of times in Scripture. And Sedek is righteous or could be priest because priests are to be righteous. It's a righteous priesthood. However, Hebrews defined how we are to read this as king of righteousness. That's what it says, period, done, the end. And there is only one 
in this order. It's all that can fit, and that is Messiah. Nothing to discuss. It is defined without any scholar, and how dare they redefine it. King of Salem does not mean King of Jerusalem, Israel, either. It means King of Peace. Also, only one. He interpreted, because really, Lord of the Sabbath is a similar title. He interpreted it for us. Again, as we said last video, there is a heavenly Jerusalem. So, even so, Yahushua is from there. Not Jerusalem, Israel. He wasn't even born in Jerusalem, Israel, in fact. Is this a new concept in Hebrews? No. We already covered Psalm interprets this as Messiah. It does. Hebrews makes that clear abundantly. However, the temple priests also kept a scroll that is worth noting, and this is going to blow your mind. The Heavenly Prince Melchizedek. That's what the scroll is titled. Uh, 11Q13, dated to the mid-1st century B.C., before Messiah and before Hebrews was written. Found in archaeology. This is not debatable. Found in Cave 11 in Qumran, Bethabara, where the exiled temple priests kept Bible canon and their library. We have a link to a free copy you can download at the bottom of the screen on each of these uh, slides. This is from the complete Dead Sea Scrolls by Giza Verbs, a very credible publishing of these scrolls, updated even in recent years. Now, this is commentary. You look at this. They render scripture. Leviticus 25.13 is where they start. I'm not showing that part because um, it's on a different page, but you can read it for yourself. You could go there. About the Jubilee year to start, and then they offer commentary. Of course, they go to Deuteronomy as well with the same uh, note, basically. They tell us their interpretation. That's called commentary. And remember, these are the temple priests exiled by the Pharisees, so their commentary should matter to every scholar. But most scholars are too stupid to even realize it. Who Yahushua rebuked many times, by the way, the Pharisees, but they'll follow the Pharisees as if they represent somehow the biblical religion, which isn't religion at all, it's relationship, and they were the opposite. Uh, how can that be? This is where he chose to launch his ministry, and not Jerusalem. Remember that, not the temple. The temple was defiled at that point. Watch who defiled the temple and the Hanukkah hoax, and you'll never question that again. They do this in the Qumran scrolls, this commentary, on much of Scripture. You'll see it many times. It's always the same format. So, we know what commentary is in Qumran. We also know what it is not. However, what they never do is call a book like Jubilees or Enoch. That would be illiterate of some modern stupid scholar to say so, yet they do. They don't even know what commentary is, nor how the temple practice in Qumran Bethabara applied it, even though it's right here in plain and simple well, English translated here. They use this format often, and Jubilees is certainly not as well. It is 50 chapters written in flows as Scripture, with additional content to Genesis, even. It's larger than Genesis, even. Yet, commentary? Could you be more stupid than those scholars? You really could not. Yet, you will find some dumb scholar out there claiming so in willing ignorance. It's there, believe me. They can't be so stupid, though, can they? Well, they aren't, but they're educated in a false paradigm. And that's what we mean when we say that. They never bother to test. Now, that's stupid, and that's not Scripture. Um, the Bible says, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, because Paul, of all, well knew that we would be facing this. Now let's read. It starts in Leviticus, but we'll pick up here at the commentary, because this is commentary. He shall not exact it of his neighbor and his brother for Elohim's release. 
has been proclaimed, talking about the Jubilee. Again, this is Deuteronomy as well, uh, just the tail end of it, so I'll, I'll mention that. Uh, it's dealing with the Jubilee year of release from debts. We will have another release on the Day of Judgment, uh, a big release. So that, that's, a, that's really what this is going for, and you'll see. Uh, that is Yahuwah's system, by the way, not usury, which is slavery. See, debts are to be forgiven every jubilee. That's the way his system was structured so that there would be no slavery. But get this, and it will be proclaimed at the end of days concerning the captives, as he said, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Isaiah is quoted there. Its interpretation is, what, 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 what? what? They, they said, what? Got that? When Qumran is offering commentary, they place the scripture, and then they say this. The interpretation is, you got that, stupid scholars? Learn how to read, because many do not, and they don't get this, and they're out there claiming, oh, Jubilees is commentary. You're stupid. That's it. There's nothing to discuss along that. You don't even know what the word commentary means that he will assign them to the sons of heaven and to the inheritance of who? Melchizedek? In an end times context from the Dead Sea Scrolls? Whose inheritance are believers? Scripture is clear. That is his ecclesia, including Israel. True Israel, the people, not this modern nation, which is not the people Israel. For he will cast their lot amid the portions of Melchizedek, who will return them there and will proclaim to them liberty. This is in the very end times. The Jubilee forgiveness will apply on the day of judgment forward, essentially, forgiving them the wrongdoings of all their iniquities, so also for sin. Now, did Shem have the power to forgive sins? No, that would be stupid, right? Yet, insert said scholar, stupid it is. Just as Forrest Gump said, stupid is as stupid does. And that's why we use the word, uh, the Bible does too, by the way, many times. Go read it. Does the archangel Michael? No, equally dumb. Again, these are not Bible scholars. And yes, even Giza Verms, who published these translations, thinks this could be Michael, though let's be clear, he does not commit, as most scholars don't. See, it's easy to do that. You just kind of flounder in between. It could be this, or it could be that, or it could be this. Oh, I like what that guy says, you know, yet they don't render a final opinion when it comes down to it. But they don't have to render an opinion. They can just read Scripture and understand it. Now, he has a couple of possibilities including this being Messiah, so he didn't rule that out. He just doesn't commit. He would be shamed if he ever did commit to that as the truth, yet Scripture does very clearly as you have seen. This is not in question. And this thing will occur in the first week of the Jubilee that follows the nine Jubilees. Interpreting Torah there, that's what this is. Now, we don't have time to go into this as we want to get to Melchizedek, Melchizedek here. Uh, and the Day of Atonement is the end of the 10th Jubilee, when all the sons of light, that's the sons of Zadok and Qumran, and the men of the lot of Melchizedek, now wait, now, there's a lot of Melchizedek. I thought you said he's only one. Ah, indeed, there is. That's us. These writings use that term, such as lot of Belial. You'll see several times, or basically those who serve Satan. They're not Satan. They are his lot. They serve him. We are the lot of Melchizedek if we are true believers. We follow him. We are not, however, the one and only Melchizedek, that's not what it says, it's just not there, will be atoned for. All the more reason why it's clear we are not Melchizedek, but his lot. We're the ones being atoned for. 
And his statute concerns them to provide them with their rewards. For this, get this, is the moment of the year of grace for Melchizedek. Wow! Now what is that? In the end times. It is the day of judgment when believers receive grace. And that's your gospel of grace, folks. There it is, right there. Any such without Melchizedek. And that's Old Testament too is incomplete. Now, he'll affirm the time, and he will, by his strength, judge the holy ones of Elohim, executing judgment as it is written concerning him in the songs of David, song, who said, Elohim has taken his place in the divine council. That's where we read right out of there uh, in the last video. That's not Yahuwah who is already there, but it is Messiah who takes the seat at his right hand. In the midst of the Elohim, he holds judgment. And then it gives you the scripture. Yahushua is and must be Elohim, God. Scripture is so clear on that and it is undeniable. We know there are whole churches out there with such doctrine. We'll get there at some point, but it is the doctrine of men. For him to execute what he does on the day of judgment alone, qualifies him as Elohim, which is plural, by the way, and means heavenly being. However, he is the Elohim of creation when there was no heaven yet, and he created alongside the Father, according to John and Paul in Jubilees. We covered this in detail in the 22 works of creation in this series. Watch it. And it was concerning him that he said, Let the assembly of the peoples return to the height above them. El, God, singular, will judge the peoples, and then the scripture and song. As for that which he said, How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? He is no respecter of persons. No, it is not his desire that any should perish, but he is righteous and the wicked will perish, or he would not be righteous. Selah in the Psalm Scripture. Its interpretation, whoop, there it is again, what? Its interpretation concerns Belial, that's Satan, and the spirits of his lot. See, notice again, they are not Satan. They are his lot. They serve him. Uh, that is how Qumran writes, and you'll see that many times. These are the demons, not angels even, just demons, who rebelled by turning away from the precepts of Elohim to, now that's a fragment, so that part's missing, and Melchizedek will avenge the vengeance of the judgments of Elohim. Now we know who that is. Yahushua judges the world and consumes the unrighteous, even their spirits, and even those angels who rebelled, and they will be gone for forever. And he will drag them from the hand of Belial, Satan, and from the hand of all the spirits of his lot, Satan's lot, the demons, and all the Elohim of justice. These are his holy angels, which in fact we have covered in Answers in Second Esther, and you read in Revelation, certainly him in the end to assist him in executing judgment, will come to his aid to attend to the destruction of Belial, Satan. And the height is, again, fragment, so we're missing this part. All the sons of God, that's angels, this is fragmented here, this, this is the day of peace, salvation. Now, when's that? The day of judgment. Yes, the temple practice knew this, and even before Messiah, they wrote, here it is. Concerning which Elohim spoke through Isaiah the prophet, who said, now we all know this verse, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who proclaims peace, who brings good news. You mean the king of peace? Oh, how about that? Who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your Elohim reigns. And it gives the scripture in Isaiah. Its interpretation, ah, again, any modern scholar who disagrees with the temple's interpretation of Scripture, <laughs> they're not a Bible scholar, that's for sure. 
The mountains are the prophets, and the messenger is the anointed one of the Spirit. No, it's not you and me. That's not all believers. It is specific to Messiah, Melchizedek, concerning whom Daniel said, until an anointed one, a prince, Daniel, uh, scripture there, 9.25, notice in their commentary. They have invoked Daniel, Isaiah, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. These are well-skilled temple priests interpreting Scripture for you and me, and we ignore it because we're told that these are scary, and they were Essenes when not a single mention of the word Essene in all of the fragments, but they identify as the exiled temple priests, the sons of Zadok, the uh, Levite priests over a hundred times. It's ridiculous. It's the dumbest piece of scholarship in history, yet they're pulling off this fraud right before our eyes in this day. Any scholarship going against these, especially when it would also have to go against, well, the book of Hebrews, is not scholarship, it's not biblical anyway. And he who brings good news, who proclaims salvation, it is concerning him that is written. Him. Not all of us. This isn't about us. This is about him. To comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion. And it gives the scripture in Isaiah again. To comfort those who mourn, its interpretation. To make them understand all the ages of time. Now that is what these two videos are about. For Melchizedek brings together the true gospel for all time as Messiah always does. The gospel begins in Genesis 1.1. In truth, will turn away from Belial, Satan. By the judgments, these are fragments, so you'll see the dot, dot, dots, of Elohim, as it is written concerning him who says to Zion, your Elohim reigns. This is Messiah, who is Melchizedek, according to the temple priests as well. But who is Zion? Well, they tell us that too. Let's cover that. Zion is those who uphold the covenant. You mean in the end times? Yes, we covered this in our Sabbath series. You can read the evidence for yourself. It's there in Revelation. It's there in the words of Messiah. To the end invoked. In rest, the case for Sabbath free at restsabbath.org. Download it now. Who turn from walking in the way of the people. Now, the church doesn't generally. And your Elohim is Melchizedek. Oh, look at that. It's not just a title. It is specifically Messiah only who will save them from the hand of Belial, Satan. Only Yahusha fits. Then it continues with more commentary on Leviticus. Is this not clear? It matches Hebrews, which matches Psalm, and ultimately they all coalesce with Genesis. Wow. Resolved. Folks, there is no debating. Yahusha is Melchizedek, the king of righteousness for all of time. He has no beginning and no end. You know, from Revelation, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I mean, it's the same language, really hard to misunderstand. There is no other man in all of history who could fit this, especially not Shem, which is illiterate to Scripture. No angel could either. This is a man in spirit form. In Genesis, not in the flesh, yet Hebrews is clear, Melchizedek was made flesh, and we know that is Messiah only. There is nothing to question on this regarding the identity of this mysterious figure, truly the only valid king and priest as well in all of Scripture from a righteousness standpoint. He is plainly Messiah and no one else. He is Elohim, called so by Yahuwah in Psalm, yet he is not an angel. And even Enoch saw him before the flood in heaven. And he is defined in Jubilees by Paul in Ephesians 3, 9, and John 1 as well. I mean, it's as if they don't even want to understand. This is so messed up in so many circles, yet we hope this video has brought you clarity so you can now know.
prove all things for yourself. But we declare Yahusha is Melchizedek, the king of peace, the king of righteousness, the one and only in an order of one. Pretty easy to narrow down. Yah bless to everyone. The Book of Jubilees, the Torah calendar, named by the temple priests in Qumran as the source of the exact determination of how to keep Torah's calendar in the Damascus document. Yes, they called it Torah and used it as such. This book renders the very first map of the world, the most ancient geography in all of history. Jubilees also known as the Book of Division, as Noah partitions the entire earth to his three sons, finds the Garden of Eden in the Philippines, pinpoints the seat of Gog of Magog's power, demonstrates continental divides originate with Noah and much more. It is the second witness to Genesis and Torah and concurs. It tests as Torah and we encourage you to review this full test for yourself in the beginning of this book. It was the priests who were exiled from the temple who lived in Qumran, known in Bible times as Bethabara, where Messiah was baptized and John the Baptist of temple priestly caste lived and operated. As these were his fellow Levite priests exiled from the temple, who continued to keep scripture there, as well as operate a function, compound, modeled in part after the temple. This is the only historic library of precedence for the Old Testament canon in ancient history, yet explained away in willing ignorance, just as 2 Peter 3 warned. Based on the R.H. Charles translation from the Ethiopic, this book will enlighten and its revelation will rock your world. As all 50 chapters appear in this book with curated and edited margin notes, in large print Bible format, easy to read. This 288-page quality paperback has a high-resolution section of maps that represent the world's oldest map by Noah. Read it and test it for yourself, and you will likely find, as we have, this book is inspired, even canon, in history. 
Available free worldwide in ebook or purchase a print copy today on Shopee Philippines or Amazon internationally. Just go to bookofjubilees.org and the links are there for your area. We also offer bundle pricing with our other books in the Philippines. Our books are already expanding now, being read in 52 countries and more than half of the provinces in the Philippines. Join thousands who are finding this useful in their lives.